Live from the campus of MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts, it's theCUBE, covering the MIT Chief Data Officer and Information Quality Symposium. Now, here are your hosts, Stu Miniman and Paul Gillen. Welcome back, this is theCUBE at the MIT CDO IQ Conference. Paul Gillen here with Stu Miniman, and uh, you know, we're all about busting myths here at theCUBE, and so let's bust a couple more. Uh, we're joined here today by the CDO of the city of Syracuse, New York. And myth number one is that you have to be an old guy to be a CDO. Our guest is 31 years old. Uh, myth number two is that you have to have a, uh, an IT background or a heavy technical background. Our guest, Sam Edelstein, has been, among other things, a newspaper reporter, an English teacher, and a social media manager, uh, but now getting a master's degree in information management. So clearly the tech does count for something, but it's not necessarily uh, the, the uh, required requirement for the job. Sam, thanks for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. I want to ask you first about a tweet you posted recently called, why Pokemon Go is the future of city, uh, will change urban planning forever. I've been trying to get used to Pokemon Go the last couple of days. I can't quite get into the habit, yeah. but why, why do you have this disruptive view? I, well, I think I, uh, I like tuned out for a minute and then all of a sudden it was all the rage and bigger than, than Twitter. And a, so, a week ago. Yeah. yeah. And I'm like walking around downtown Syracuse and I see a couple of people like walking around and about to walk into a road because they're, playing Pokemon Go, and so I figured um, this if it keeps on growing like that, we're going to have to plan for how people are going to be walking. I've even seen some tweets about people posting uh, signs that say that, um, you know, don't Pokemon and, and drive or something like that. So we may have to keep that in mind as one, we're One more reason to be distracted, only now we're that's not right. just a threat on the roads, we're a threat on the sidewalks as well. That's right, that's right. Um, you came about this this job a, a rather circuitous route. Uh, what and this is the first uh, CDO job the city has had. Yeah. Uh, maybe you can talk about why the position was created and what uh, about it appealed to you to be the uh, uh, the uh, uh, coal, coal, excuse me the canary in the coal mine, if you were. Yeah. Um, so I think my background, uh, I've always been interested in using data in a variety of different ways, even if it wasn't sort of the main um, job responsibility. It was informing me of, of the ways that I was doing my work. And so I knew the importance of it, um, you know, whether I was thinking about what's the most effective way to market an, an organization um, on social media, or, um, you know, or I, I worked for Syracuse University in our alumni office and thinking about what's the best way to use our data to plan events or to, to figure out which events might work best or how to reach people in the best way, how to email people in the best way. Um, so then when I came to uh, work for the city of Syracuse, you know, had the same attitude coming in. Um, the, the job that I, I came in doing was, was much more data heavy um, and just realized that we didn't have easy access to all that data. Um, and so talked about how that could be built more and more and more. And um, I think as, as uh, some of the administration also realized that that was something that they wanted to get um, more into and that uh, being a city that has limited funds, um, you know, we need to be smart about the decisions that we're making. Um, it became apparent that this was the type of job that would be needed so that someone could think sort of globally about what data is out there and where does it need to be combined so that we can make the best decisions um, for, the, for the city. So, so Sam, can you help us understand what, what's the reporting structure that you have there and was sure. that kind of, is there a formal mandate you, you were talking a little bit about there? What, what, what do they see as kind of the, how do they know that you've succeeded in your job? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I have to ask my boss about that. Um, so uh, we have an office of innovation that was actually funded uh, about a year and a half ago by Bloomberg Philanthropies. There are innovation offices in 19 cities across the world um, and Syracuse is lucky enough to have one of them. So that's originally how I came on board. Um, now I'm much more a part of uh, the sort of formal city structure, but I work within that office with the thought being that we are an office that sort of serves as a consulting internal consulting firm to the city. So we're sort of thinking globally about all things. We aren't just within one silo. Um, and so, you know, we, we go around and, and sort of take on different problems and think about how to solve them, and it's all very data-driven. So I think it makes sense for me to be there. In terms of success, um, you know, we, our office is very much metric-driven, so we're, we're thinking about the changes that are being made. Have they been, um, have they been impactful sort of from an outcome basis instead of an output basis? So, um, you know, are we saving dollars? Are we 
giving a better product to our citizens, even if it's just, it, it's not how many roads are we paving, is like overall are people having a smoother drive on, on the streets. Um, and so thinking about that, I think then my role is, you know, ensuring that we know about the data that we have and that there are some things that are less data driven, I guess, but thinking, you know, when, when people are d deciding about things, are they thinking about it from the data that they have or are they just making gut? gut reactions to it. And so part of it, I think, is just talking about some of that culture um, within the city. In, in the keynote this morning, Tom Davenport talked about a CDO needs to have a balance of offense and defense. Yeah. Uh, how does that resonate with you, and how, how do you look at that uh, from, from your job? Yeah, for sure. Um, right now, I think a lot of it is is getting a just a grasp of what's going on in general. And so there are certainly places where um, we probably need some work on just having a good sense of what's out there so that we, we can play a good defense and to figure out what where there might be um, threats to some of the data security. Um, and, and I'm not sure that we know all of that quite yet. But additionally, I think there is a lot of room to just, there's a lot of low hanging fruit where we could say, you know, why do we make this decision? There isn't a whole bunch of reasoning behind it sometimes and so uh, but there is data that we can use and so thinking about how do we use that data to make better decisions um, there there are opportunities all over the place and sometimes the struggle is like figuring out which one do you focus on first You've only been in the job five months the jobs yeah. only five months old uh, and you're coming in fresh like this was it, did anything surprise you about what you found um, I, I think I had a sense about that there would be siloed data and that it would be messy data but some of the ways that it is organized is is surprising. I think you know, uh, it's not always easy to figure out which address uh, we're talking about. If you're looking at our neighborhood office versus our zoning office versus 911 versus all these different places, we could be referring to the same piece of land data in a different issue, way. Yeah. It's a data quality yeah. issue for sure, um, and that's something that that has been worked on and just needs to continue to be worked on. Well, what are some what's some of the potential that you see as you look at these silos, you look and start start trying to harmonize them, bring them together, yep. get people sharing. What is some of the immediate potential that you see? So one of the mayor's top priorities and, and one of the things that she talks about a ton is infrastructure problems. Uh, the city has water mains that break all the time, um, hundreds of times a year, um, potholes throughout the city, roads are deteriorating, sewers are in, in uh, trouble, which is a common issue for cities across the country sure and really across the world. Um, we it, That data, though, lives in silos, so we may know where our potholes are and we may know where our water main breaks are, but that hasn't always been combined. Um, and then so we'll go and do a, a project to repave a road, um, but we didn't look at how many water main breaks there have been underneath that road in the last 10 years. So working to combine that together and getting a sense of like what's the overall risk to this road and where does it make sense to invest the hundreds of thousands of dollars that it takes to repave and, and to redo an entire road, reconstruct an entire road. Um, you know, there's not that many hundreds of thousands of dollars to go around, and so making sure that you make a good choice about which one you're going to take on um, is really important. And if you don't, um, you know, you spend $100,000 repaving a road and then a water main blows up, um, you know, it's not all for naught, but, um, but there's definitely, uh, you know, the road loses some, some of its lifespan, and so that is uh, obviously a problem in terms of the way that we can best deliver some services. So uh, warehousing some of that data, making sure that we're looking at it critically so that when our public works department is thinking about where they're going to do work, uh, we're getting all of the underground infrastructure fixed first uh, if there's problems there so that we don't repave a road and then have problems later on. Yeah. Um, we, we've heard from the, the federal government people at the, sh at, at the event here uh, that the kind of the impacts and ramifications of the open da data mandate, uh, how does that impact what you're doing? And I'd also like to understand how security fits into your job role and what you do with data. Yeah, um, so open data is really interesting and I'm, I'm a big supporter of the sort of concept of it. Um, the city hasn't sort of taken that on as a mandate um, itself yet, um, but I think that's something that we are thinking about and, and potentially working towards. The, the benefit of it though, um, you know, we use federal data and state data all the time um, to help inform some of, some of our work, or sometimes we don't have information because it hasn't been collected, it's on paper that there are other agencies that have collected in some way. Um, so like traffic counts in New York State 
there on the New York State data portal, and so open data portal, and so we can see where the heaviest traffic is in our city. Um, you know, from that's being measured every single year. Maybe not as uh, detailed as what we would collect, but we don't collect it um, in the same way. So, um, so it's there. So there's a lot of value to us um, from other levels of government having open data, and so I think that then um, makes sense to me to think about like how could our data help to benefit other levels of government or businesses in the city, just residents who are interested. We have a great university in our city um, who is full of uh, you know, researchers who do research in other cities that have opened up their data. I'd love it if they did that research in our city. You raise a great point, which is uh, about open data, which is one thing to have the data open, that's great, but how do you find it? How do you know that the data is out there? Do yeah. you have a means whether it's a uh, whether you network with other CDOs in other cities, or is there an organization or some kind of a database where you could find out what's available to you? Uh, yeah. So I mean, the the portals generally you can search them, but I think one of the one of the problems that, or I don't know if it's a problem, but one of the issues that I think often gets called out is like, okay, you release the data, but is anyone actually using it? And and then what are they using it for? And so I guess my attitude as we go forward thinking about how would we open up data is is um, you know, I think it's important to be transparent and thinking about it that way, but then also thinking about it in a demand-driven sort of way where we'd say, you know, maybe this is how we sort of first release first data sets is if there are businesses that are saying we would be able to grow our business if we had this sort of data, that might be a key data set to release. Um, and uh, you know, I think thinking about which which data sets are going to be used the most is a is a good way to uh, think about what you should invest time cleaning and making sure that there's good descriptions about that data and all of that. So, Sam, uh, the security question, I guess, how yeah. does that oh. fit into your role? Yeah, I mean, it's important. I, I'm not sure that we've totally gotten there yet. There are certainly a lot of um, security issues that come up uh, globally. Our IT department deals with, um, you know, making sure that we have um, all sorts of lockdowns on, on our uh, computers within the organization. But I think going forward as we think about releasing data, you know, we aren't going to release live crime data, um, you know, that's showing exactly where a crime com was committed the this, this, this second before. Um, so, but, um, but there is probably also a, a amount of time that can go by and some anonymization that can um, be put on that data where it still makes sense to release it um, you know with the right sort of uh, security checks in place so I don't know exactly what that is and and um, I think it's just something that we are going to go forward and and think about you know in consultation with our law department um, looking at best practices from other cities there are other cities who have figured a lot of this out and so looking to them to sort of guide us um, I think can be really useful. Uh, have you selected platforms that you will use as you take this data and try to harmonize it? Um, sort of, not not really. I mean, a lot of it, um, you know, we we uh, a lot of our uh, organizations use Microsoft products to sort of do their analysis. Um, we have uh, other payroll software where we do hold it, um, SQL Server databases that hold a lot of our data. Um, but in terms of how we would present it. Um, no, we, we haven't totally gotten there yet. I think that's part of what I've been working on is thinking about how do we, you know, what are the best ways to visualize it? How much of it is us internally coding, you know, visualizations so that we're, we're doing it on our own versus, um, you know, procuring software to, to do it for us. So Almost out of time here, but I have yep. to ask you this question. Uh, you're 31 years old, you look 18. <laughs> uh, you're working in, uh, in government, which has a lot of very long time employees. Yeah. Ha has it been an issue with you, someone with your, uh, youth uh, uh, influencing you know people who've been around a lot longer than you. Um, yeah, I think so. I mean, it, it, there are times when I'll say, you know, that's not what the data says, and people don't like that very much. Um, but I think it, you know it, it's a good check for me to think about. Let's make sure that the analysis is really correct, and then let's talk about like how you might. How does this data help to support your job already, and how does it maybe make it easier? So we had an issue where uh, we were considering um, our budgeting for a certain uh, project that we were doing. We said, you know, it costs thirty dollars a square yard to do this thing. Really didn't after looking at the analysis and where like there was money left over every year. So we looked at that, figured out where, why is this money being not not being spent essentially um, and it turned out it was actually like twenty five dollars a square yard to do the project um, so that actually saves the the well it doesn't save any money but it allows them to do more work than they would have done before so this was a department that 
uh, I had, um, you know, some some disagreements with in terms of how we use um, how we should be using data. Um, for some of the projects that we do. And I think that's the sort of way that then I said, hey, you can do one more project this year um, because there's this sort of identified savings. So I try to do it that way. It's not always perfect, but um, I think there is some understanding that like, you know, this is an appointed position from the mayor. And so um, she's interested in being more data driven as well. And so if I can go in and push for that, um, sometimes gently, sometimes not as much. Um, hopefully it can be effective, but that's definitely part of the, the learning curve as well. Sam Edelstein, it's been a pleasure speaking with you. It's Thanks, great guys. to see someone with your uh, your youth, your passion, uh, your vigor for the job. Uh, I'm sure uh, government could use more, more people like you. Thanks, Thanks. for joining us Appreciate today. Appreciate it. We'll be back with our next guest in a minute.